Welcome to this presentation where we delve into promoting student health and well-being. My name is Vaidhi Chavan. I am a homestay coordinator for the Langi School District 35. I support their international student program. This presentation is split into two segments and I'll be taking you through my part. My presentation will cover various aspects that contribute to overall student well-being. We will begin by discussing subjective well-being uh, because it is a crucial element in understanding the holistic nature of wellness. Then we will move on to the arousal wellness model, a framework that helps us dissect and comprehend the complex interplay between our emotional experiences. To enhance our understanding further, I have designed a mind map coupled with some insightful case studies and these, the inclusion of these case studies will offer real world examples that underscore the practical applications of the concepts we are currently exploring. As we navigate through these topics, we cannot overlook the significant impact of power and privilege on wellness. So let's begin. So a little bit about myself. I started my journey in Canada as an international student back in 2014. From my very first job as a residence ambassador in 2015, giving dorm room tours to prospective students and families, to my current role working with students as young as 13, this evolution has been incredible. One key aspect that significantly contributed to my success was the diverse range of support services provided by my university. Whether facing academic challenges or seeking counseling, knowing where to turn for help made all the difference. Today, I want to delve into the critical intersection of wellness and international education. High school students, especially those in my current role, require a more structured approach to wellness. Uh, in my meetings, I use a scale that straightforwardly asks, today, on a scale of one to 10, how difficult is this for you? My interactions with young kids continually serve as a grounding force, offering a reminder that sometimes we do need to perceive life through simpler terms. However, post-secondary students are going through a different developmental stage altogether. For example, there are strict rules about disclosing information to their parents in terms of a mental health crisis. Now, what if I shared a unique formula with you, one that can be applied universally to enhance your wellness approach when working with students, regardless of their background? For that, let's start with some basics. I want to take a moment and reflect on what wellness means. WHO discusses how it's not merely the absence of disease. However, when I was doing my research, I came across this definition, which says wellness can be understood as how people feel and how they function both on a personal and social level, and how they evaluate their lives as a whole. I want you to take a moment and focus on the second part of this definition as to how they evaluate their lives as a whole. I found this definition to be very comprehensive, especially the second part of it. Applying this to an international student's journey, what it tells us is that the experience of wellness, you know, it extends beyond excelling academically and staying healthy. It encapsulates the idea of thriving in every aspect of their student experience. And as many of you might already know, these nine dimensions mentioned here have evolved over time in the field of psychology, sociology, and health. To me, these dimensions convey that the concept of wellness is inherently very inclusive in nature. That is, it does not discriminate. It's a universal goal. It's a shared human experience. Everyone watching this presentation right now, you know, deserves to not just be healthy, but you deserve to thrive in your wellness goal. And the same applies to your students. I've compiled this next slide to highlight the variety present in the regions our student community originates from. The countries marked in red represent the top 10 based on Statistics Canada. Uh, it's essential to challenge homogeneity by avoiding a one-size-fits-all approach to international student community, as it may result in neglecting the rich diversity within the community itself. This diversity is pretty evident in the considerable variations in wellness practices across different cultures and regions. If you were to ask me that if I ever felt like an outsider when I was a student, I would say sometimes yes. I understood that limited interactions with international students from diverse backgrounds sometimes lead to generalizations. For example, 
what people thought was a compliment to me, uh, which said, you speak English really well. Every time in, I interacted with someone on campus or in my workplace when I was a recent graduate on a work permit, it felt uncomfortable because English has been my primary language since kindergarten and I've spent my entire life in the Middle East. So I had to take a moment and then I had to act like I had to express gratitude for fitting into a perceived checkbox and it qu seemed quite unnecessary and imposed. While the intention may be positive when we do provide such compliments, it kind of promotes a feeling of otherness. Another example is when my name was shortened to Vai instead of Idehi because my coworkers thought the pronunciation was difficult. Well, shortening names, which is quite a common practice in Canada, often done with, you know, casually or with good intentions, it could have an intended effect on an individual's well-being. Uh, during my first day at work, something um, my coworker did was she wrote my name. She broke it down into three parts and put it on the desk. And this simple gesture filled with kindness made a huge difference in my integration with, within my workplace. Now that we discussed diversity within different geographic regions, let's explore another facet of diversity. I'm going to avoid explaining the scientific definitions of each of these two concepts. Uh, instead, imagine this. Imagine living in a place where people really like doing their own things. They love choosing what they want to do and making their own decisions. It's like everyone is a superhero with their special powers and they really enjoy using them. That's an individualistic culture. Now think about another place where everyone loves working together like a big team. They care a lot about their family and friends and always try to help each other. It's like being a part of a big family or a team where everyone works together to make great things great for everyone. That's collectivistic culture. And both these different kinds of culture determine what well-being means to a person. Well-being is strongly correlated to self-esteem and sense of personal achievement in an individ individualistic culture. Whereas in a collectivist culture, well-being is strongly related to interpersonal goals, community harmony, and social roles. And you can use a metaphor to remember both of these. I like to share uh, the metaphor of stars and tapestry. It is very crucial to recognize that both these cultures possess unique strengths and face distinct challenges. So essentially, how happy and healthy someone feels is often influenced by their own experiences and the way things are done in their group of people. I've already talked a bit about our cultural backgrounds and now I want to focus on something else. Let's lay the foundation by examining two key dimensions that define our emotional experiences, arousal and valence. This model can be understood using a metaphor. We did talk about what happens outside, but it's also important to talk about what happens inside. The emotional landscape metaphor helps convey that emotions can be mapped based on their intensity and whether they're positive or negative in nature, creating a multidimensional space where various emotional experiences are situated. Just like different terrains in a landscape, different emotional states can be visually represented based on their arousal and valence within this model. Remember, at the beginning of the presentation, I told you that I use a scale with my meetings uh, with my kids. It's as simple as that. When a student walks in your office, classroom, or approaches you, try to map their emotional landscape. So let's take a look at how, how to map your student's emotions. Let's say that your student is high on arousal and is experiencing pleasant emotions. He's probably excited, happy, delighted, um, and very amused. Another example is your student is feeling unpleasant emotions and low on arousal, sad, depressed, gloomy. Now consider the impact of culture on these landscapes. Cultural influences shape how we express our emotions. What are the norms, what are our values, and the display rules and relationships. And recognizing these cultural differences helps us avoid ethnocentrism, and it fosters a more comprehensive understanding of emotional experiences. In simple words, what does this mean? It means that, you know, for example, a big happy party might be very common and a good feeling event in one culture, while a quite thoughtful time during a special ceremony could be also seen 
as a good feeling moment in that culture. So keeping this in mind, you know, this will allow us to design more supportive programs where we foster a more inclusive environment, keeping in mind the different, different emotional landscapes of students. Now, this is my favorite part. You might be wondering that she talked about various topics and they seemed quite disconnected, but not really. Let's bring everything we have talked about together diversity, regional differences, types of culture, and emotional landscapes. Let's explore some examples of support programs that can work well for a comprehensive student group. Let's give it a name, your wellness toolkit. Regional diversity could be incorporated by tailoring programs to address specific needs and challenges prevalent in different areas. Effective support initiative would consider not only the cultural aspects, but also the emotional experiences that vary across regions. In a sense, various programs should act like a toolbox with a variety of tools to support everyone, understanding that each person brings their own cultural background, emotional style, and cultural influence to the table. This way support becomes not only inclusive, it becomes responsive to the diverse needs of our students. Due to our time constraints, I'll briefly showcase just a few examples. You'll have access to these slides and feel free to email me to discuss and expand on any of these programs here. Uh, perhaps one or more of these programs will strike a chord with you. Take a moment to consider how these diverse support initiatives align with your wellness goals for your students. I really like to focus um, I would really like to take a moment to focus on mental health. Uh, if you see under mental health, there are group counseling sessions, which could be an effective tool for people from collectivistic cultures. There are peer support programs, which can be tailored to different regions. We can make resource material available in the students' regional languages for more easy access, or we can have counseling support available in their own regional languages. Another uh, example for language, language support would be offering conversation partners to students, which also promote a kind of supportive environment to practice conversational English, and also offering multilingual resources like you know, language tutors who speak multiple languages and who can support a student uh, based on whatever they're comfortable with. I've covered a range of subjects and have given you different types of tools of how a support program may look like, and you might be wondering how they all connect. Uh, the connection becomes clear when we do put it into action. Consider four students. Student A is Canadian, student B is Chinese, student C is Indian, and student D is Brazilian. Drawing from the toolkit essentials we just discussed, let's envision how a support plan might unfold. To start, I organize students for me in my possession. I, what I organize students you know, for, uh, by their country. This helps me follow their progress throughout their time here because what we need to keep agencies and natural parents in the loop in our program. So it allows me to see a pattern within a certain group because most of the students um, tend to face similar issues when they come from similar backgrounds. I also use a very creative tool, which is designed by my team. It's called a homestay video that shows the student's homestay journey and guidelines in a fun animated format. It's available in different languages too, making it easy for our young students to understand without slogging through pages of rules. These are two ways in how we tailor our programs to make it more accessible for the student age group we work with. So coming back to this table where let's take two students here. Um, Let's take student C, who comes from an Indian background, and their cultural traits are blended. Uh, some of the main challenges for student C would be balancing personal goals and family expectations, as we do know that India is predominantly a collectivistic culture. So when we are supporting the student and providing counseling, maybe one of the goals for counseling would be balancing between individual and family aspirations. Uh, emotional skill workshops may include mindfulness and self-reflection, uh, proper goal setting, and a positive campus environment may look like something 
like diverse cultural events, being a part of a big group, feeling connected to your own people. Let's say, uh, let's take a look at student A, who's Canadian. Um, this student tends to come from an individualistic culture. So what does counseling and mental health support look for this student? It may be individual focused and assertive. A positive campus environment includes celebrating personal achievements because like I said, individual students like to focus on their personal strengths. But having said all this, this is just an example. I do not mean to perpetuate any generalizations about a country or a student group. This is just one example just to showcase that you could have four different students with four different personalized wellness plans. We talked about how wellness, the concept is inherently inclusive in nature, you know, but making it accessible to everyone is a complex task. While the table provides a starting point for understanding and tailoring support strategies, it is crucial to approach the well-being of international students with sensitivity and flexibility. Any form of grouping or cultural assumptions can have severe consequences. Please refer to this wheel, which beautifully captures the power and privileges which we all hold in this complex world. While you can explore this wheel at your own time, please remember that the concept of equity and equality applies too. Equality is about providing same tools to all your 100 students. Equity is about taking into consideration that 40 out of those 100 might need special, additional, unique tools to succeed. This table is adapted from IRCC anti-racism strategy, and I really like how this wheel gives us, you know, provides us as a tool for a moment of reflection that us as educators, we come from different privileges and different powers, and our students hold these in different um, intensities as well. So let's redefine well-being to nurture our global minds. We have understood that well-being is a broad and subject, subjective concept. Superficial programs and events can fall short of addressing the comprehensive nature of wellness. True wellness initiatives go beyond surface level offerings and delve into supporting the holistic well-being of individuals. Feedback is important because a student decides what works for them. Regular evaluation helps in adjusting interventions based on evolving needs. In challenging conversations, I often say, don't offer apples to those who cherish oranges. This metaphor underscores the essence of effective connection. It's about recognizing and providing what the other person truly needs and desires, rather than showcasing the contents of your own food basket. An example of uh, a supportive initiative would be providing training to staff on cultural competency because wellness is dynamic and it can fluctuate over time. It's not a one-size-fits-all concept. What works for one student may not work for another. So as educators, despite our best intentions, we occasionally may make mistakes and that's perfectly okay. It's important to embrace your learning journey as well and keep in mind that your wellness is equally important. I encourage all of you to revisit my slides and reflect on anything that may have resonated with you. I would love to connect and chat about any topic you would like to discuss in greater detail. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Hello and welcome to a presentation on ways to promote international student health and well-being. My name is Gaia. I am the Director of Well-being and Accessibility Services at UBC Okanagan, and I hold a number of roles that include technical expert on Canada's national standard for the mental health and well-being of post-secondary students. It is such a pleasure to be with you. Today's presentation is deliberately brief, so that we have ample time for Q&A. If you are joining us after the live presentation, please feel free to email me your questions. I would be happy to answer. In this presentation, I will discuss two broad topics about the health and well-being needs of international students and example programs to address these needs. Let's begin. In 2022, 
Canada hosted more than 800,000 international students. It is such a privilege to educate some of the world's youths and in return, learn from them and improve our own knowledge. But this privilege brings a great responsibility to understand the needs of international students. And symposiums like this are powerful contributors towards this understanding. And so there are a few things to understand in the realm of international student health and well-being. The first is the impact of language barriers. A student who struggles to communicate in English will see other areas of their lives suffer. Importantly, it's not just their academic performance that is affected. It also impacts their ability to form friendships in their host country complete tasks that contribute to self-sufficiency and express themselves when they have concerns. Now, as we all know, empathy and patience are incredibly important skills to cultivate. But they are especially important for us to demonstrate to demographics that struggle to communicate their needs. Because the more impatient we are, the more they will not come forward for help. And when that happens, no one wins. Next, adjusting to a new culture and norms. This might be surprising, but communities have memories. Oh, do you remember that whiteout? The power went out. And there are others. Remember when? Remember when? <laughs> now, these memories form communal bonds. And for many people, the road to feeling a sense of belonging includes learning a community's history and also participating in new memories, <laughs> like living through the next ice storm. <laughs> Part of inclusion and also feeling a sense of belonging also lies in learning about how a host community behaves. As a host community, we need to be careful about the learnings we impart. A simple example to help illustrate this is parental love. You see, some students come here and see an expression of love that may be different from what they knew. And some of these students start to question what they once cherished. To these students, I want to say loudly, your parents loved you. You would not be questioning it if you were in your home country. You're questioning it here because you are seeing a different cultural expression of love. But love, as we all know, is expressed in different ways in different cultures. And these types of examples repeat in other domains of cultural difference. Lack of nearby family and friends. Feelings of loneliness are particularly compounded if loved ones are in a different time zone and are not easily accessible. So while friendships are important for everyone, they are particularly important for students without social networks in their host country. Lack of known support services. As you can imagine, for international students, the family doctor they've always known is no longer accessible to them in Canada. These students need to build from scratch. As such, it's particularly important for universities and colleges to promote on-campus services to international students. Spiritual needs. Research suggests that international students tend to be more closely connected with their faith practices than domestic students. So from a service perspective, this encourages universities and colleges to think widely and holistically about the types of services we offer, including spiritual care. Food. It's not just access to ingredients that is important, but the manner in which we interact with food. Remember, some cultures eat with their fingers, some eat with chopsticks, others with cutlery, or a combination of any of the above. Food is deeply connected to a sense of well-being. For example, I'm South Asian. If I've not eaten rice and curry and eaten it with my fingers, I've not eaten properly regardless of whether I've eaten a dietitian approved meal from a Canadian cuisine. It's not the same. So food and having diverse food offerings on campus 
is important to well-being. Unfamiliar teaching practices. We must remember that countries have different approaches to teaching and learning, and students who are high academic achievers in one teaching practice may flounder in another. For example, I've migrated to five countries in the course of my life. I've studied under Australian teaching methods and British and Canadian. With each move, I had to reset and relearn how to learn. International students face the exact same challenge, and we sometimes forget that learning how to learn is a skill in and of itself. Now, our next section: example programming. While help seeking is becoming normalized in Canada, it may not be abroad, and may be reserved for serious illnesses only. Given this, I suggest that we shouldn't stop campaigns. I say this because, as an industry, we sometimes have conversations about "quote unquote." There's no stigma anymore. I suggest that stigma is still very real in certain demographics. So I recommend we offer targeted campaigns to key demographics such as international students. Instructor-based programs. Students look up to their instructors for sources of knowledge. As such, instructor-based programs are helpful. A few are listed on the slide. Look, engage, refer type programs help instructors with cues on how to recognize distress. Engage in open-minded and open-ended conversations, and refer to appropriate services. Early alert programs and case management services help instructors refer to students for support. I've seen institutions take different approaches with these programs. Some seek verbal consent to make the referral, while some do not require it, since the referral is to an internal department. Speak with your legal counsel. Other methods include mentioning services in syllabi. And offering University 101 courses. These 101 courses help students learn what university life is like, how to access supports, how to learn, and how to recognize and manage their own distress. Low barrier non-clinical conversations. For some students, speaking to a healthcare professional alone can be a daunting experience, especially if they're moving from child and youth healthcare systems. Into an adult system and don't have their parent or guardian beside them anymore, or if they believe that conversations with healthcare professionals should only be limited to serious illnesses. As such, two things need to happen: myth busting about what a consultation with a healthcare professional is like, and low barrier non-clinical supports, which can act as a door opener. These include conversations with trained peers. Intergenerational conversations with trained volunteer grandmas and grandpas and spiritual advisors. Finally, low barrier clinical programming. Some institutions have found success in embedding counselors into their international students' office, or providing access to twenty-four-seven telecounseling or telemedicine platforms. Bonus points if these twenty-four-seven platforms. Accommodate multiple languages and permit chat. This is important because chat functions allow students to think and translate information, and in doing so, gives them greater autonomy. Pop-up clinics around campus also brings clinicians out of the clinic and are more accessible to students, particularly if students find the clinical setting to be intimidating. And with that, my brief comments come to an end. And I invite any questions or elaborations that you would like. Thank you.